NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lenders. Woo! As an adult, don't we all miss spring break? Nothing like taking a week off from all your responsibilities. Well, here's the next best thing for adults, a spring break from house payments. SaveWithConrad.com can help you get rid of all your credit card debt, just like that. We're routinely helping our listeners save five, six, seven, even 800 bucks a month. And you don't need perfect credit or money out of your pocket to do this, but check this out. No house payments for two months at SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Foley is Pod. And of course, we couldn't do it without the Hall of Famer, the hardcore legend, Mr. Mick Foley. Mick, how are you, man? I was doing good until I see that my neck is now showing signs of aging. It's getting the, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, useful. I'd say facially useful, but other parts of my body are, uh, are showing some signs of age. Well, it happens to all of us, uh, but we're going to talk about the good times today. We're going to celebrate the life of Mr. Paul Bear. Uh, sadly, March 5th will be the 10 year anniversary of his passing. Gosh, I can't believe it's been 10 years. Wow. It has, but that it, has been a long time. He grew up, of course, William Moody. I think a lot of us first, uh, discovered Mr. Moody through his Percy Pringle, the third character. And then of course, famously. He hit the big time at the WWF as Paul Bear, but from the newsletters, it says William Moody, who grew up in Mobile, Alabama, was a lifelong wrestling fan. His entry into the business started when he was a teenager and shot photos at the matches for Gulf Coast Championship Wrestling. Ironically, his beginnings were similar to that of two of pro wrestling's other best managers of the era, Jim Cornette and Paul Heyman, who you hear in the background. Uh, they also yeah, started someone out. is at the door. My animals are not happy with it. Uh, they're letting themselves be known. All right. My wife's tending to the situation. <laughs> it's breaking down in Shreveport. <laughs> when do you first remember meeting uh, Mr. Moody? Oh, man. I remember uh, Percy for the first time meeting him in uh, World Class Championship Wrestling. I'm trying to put a month on it. Trying to think of whether it, uh, December 88 sounds about right to me, or maybe November 88, uh, he was coming back to world class. And like anybody, we've talked about this before, and you probably talked about it many times um, on other shows. When you get to be really good at being bad, people will come to appreciate you. And uh, Percival Pringle III was lively. Uh, he was humorous. Uh, and he was somebody the fans took to over time. So when he came back after a pretty lengthy absence, I don't know where he'd been. The territories were kind of dwindling at that time. I think it was down to world-class <clears throat> Memphis, Portland may have been around. Um, I think a, Kansas city may have been hanging on by a thread, a couple others by a thread. So I don't know where he went or if it was wrestling related, but when he came back, he was a baby face. And he was aligned with um, um, Eric Embry. And I think his first night back, uh, Devastation Incorporated dealt him a terrible beatdown. And that really, uh, in, you know, endeared him, endeared uh, Percy uh, to the, the, the Dallas crowd. I think he uh, breaks in the business in the summer of 74, wrestling as Mr. X in Greenville, Alabama. And it's somewhere at the same time, he finds himself interested in mortuary science. Did you know that back when you met him in world class? Um, man, this is where I don't know. I do not know. Uh, my, my guess is no, because it came as a surprise to me to find out that he was a licensed mortician when he, uh, became the undertaker's man. I'm not ruining anything by jumping ahead, right? Like, no, no, of course not. If you're listening to the show, uh, you know that uh, Percy Pringle became a Paul Bearer, legendary Hall of Fame manager. And so I do not think I knew at that time. It just feels like it writes itself. You know, the idea of a professional wrestler who also is going to become a mortician. I mean, that yeah. seems yeah. like... Yeah, oh, well... Uh, you know, I think it pays to have more. <laughs> Sorry. 
I'm about to steal from the Kevin Nash library because Kevin used to say it was great to have a guy do more than one thing. That's why he liked to visit his baker slash proctologist. <laughs> you know, Kevin Nash. <laughs> That's so fantastic. <laughs> I would go in. I had like a couple of uh, cinnamon rolls and a quick colonoscopy. <laughs> Tremendous. Um, so yeah, it did seem to write itself, and this is where, this is where I wonder whether it really happened this way or whether it's a case of just, uh, you know, using your creative crayon to color things up a little bit. Because in the popular telling. Not even Vince McMahon knew until uh, Percy was there uh, in the office, you know, more or less like, I don't know if you're auditioning or if you're under consideration for the role of, uh, of Undertaker's manager. And he found out that Paul Bearer legit uh, had a degree in mortuary science. And at that point, like you say, it's like this script is writing itself. Like you couldn't have picked a better guy. And I would have had no idea based on what Percy had done in world class and elsewhere that he could turn into this macabre yes dark but I'm, when I dark but fun in a in a in a in a, in a good sense uh, I would not have seen that guy in there and apparently uh, Mr. McMahon did when I'm curious, you knew him a long time. Uh, did you refer to him as Percy or Paul or Bill or what did you call? Him? <laughs> you know, he was always purse, uh, purse, purse. And I think even when I, I think there's a quote in my book, um, the first book, have a nice day when I came back and I was trying promos of a lengthier, uh, you know, promos that told the story. And during the height of the catchphrase boom, that was difficult to do because fans were just conditioned to either, you know, pop uh, every eight seconds or whatever the cadence you personally had was or tune you out. And on that night, they tuned me out. And I remember, you know, coming back and dropping the rough, uh, rough Foley F-bomb. And uh, I think he even said, don't worry about it, mommy. And we'll get into that nickname in a second. And I said, F those people purse. And I don't think I said uh, Paul or Uncle Paul, but as long as he had been Percy, with a few exceptions, once we did a localized promo uh, with Goldust, Marlena, uh, me and, and uh, Paul, where I referred to him as Uncle Paul, because I'd been referring to Goldust as mommy, like in local promos, it never really, it's funny because it even made the cover of WWE Magazine, even though Goldust and I had been involved in angles together, um, around that time of the summer of, uh, 96 and, um, and we went all over the country as a tag team. Uh, I don't think the mommy stuff was ever on a national level, but it really, it really, uh, it got over at least with the people involved in the promo to the point where, uh, I started calling uncle Paul and yeah, yes. And then he knew that I called gold dust mommy and he would call me mommy and I would call him uncle Paul. And that's what we were until, you know, uh, he left us. Well, when you think of modern managers that started in the eighties, boy, there's so many big ones, Jim Cornette, Bobby Heenan, Paul Heyman, Paul bear. These are iconic characters. Yeah. Before Paul became one of these iconic characters, as we mentioned, he was a wrestler. Did you ever see any of his stuff in the ring? Well, I saw his stuff when I was about 18 feet above the ring in a right. scaffold match in Fort Worth. I didn't see much of it because I dare anyone to go out there and try to find proof that Uncle Paul or Percy Pringle was in that match. It's hard to find because he and Akbar they basically went down to the mat or the scaffold in this occasion and rarely got up and Eric and I tried to do some wrestling and create some excitement. Ultimately, I broke my wrist in that match and it changed the course of my career in a weird way for the better. But uh, that was the only time I saw him wrestle. I, I, I know that when, uh, I, after I left, um, he got involved in a feud with uh, young, uh, stunning Steve Austin, but I never actually got to see what he could do. I never saw him 
uh, in any of the incarnations inside the ring. Have we pointed out that he broke in? It was Michael Hayes, right? Was there one other guy that they would go to the mat who would go to the matches with them when they were young in the Mobile area? You know, I don't know. I, I I didn't think Michael Hayes was down there then. I thought Hayes grew up in um in Pennsylvania, and then his mom think, I know, wound up. Oh, there. you're I, you're not thinking Pensacola. You're thinking Pennsylvania. I think he was. I think he was Pensacola to start, and then wound up moving to Pennsylvania. Okay, because the legend has it that uh, the two of them, along with I think one other wrestler who didn't make it, John T- Hollywood John Tatum was the other. Oh one. yeah, John Tatum was tight with Hayes. Yeah, yeah, and I think they they called themselves cousins. And you know, whether there was a relationship or just a wrestling cousin, I don't know. Uh, but I think the three of them grew up as fans attending matches together. We'll have to have a. Uh, a uh a, a follow-up just to see if that's true he leaves the business after his first son is born in the summer of 1979 but he can't stay away so mr moody comes back in 84 and starts working for championship wrestling from florida he's going to be immediately paired with the main event heel at the time rick rude and he's even going to be ringside for lex luger's debut and this of course is all as a manager so when you think about I mean, it's really kind of hard to even imagine guys who, who got out for five years and then come back and maybe in a different role because he's no longer a wrestler, he's a manager, but right away programmed with one of the top guys. That's pretty rare in wrestling to walk yeah, away. I think so. Oh. And I think as great of a worker as Rude became when he was younger and had or learned the art of the promo, and Rude will later went on to become an excellent promo guy as well. He needed something to make him that main event guy. And that, uh, appears to have been Percival Pringle the third. Well, he of course has his biggest success and biggest push there in world-class. Uh, he's managing Rick rude there, but ultimately rude is going to leave for Jim Crockett promotions, but Percy stays put here in world-class and he's going to play the, the ultimate, uh, spoiled rich kid, brat, whatever you want against the Von Eriks. How good was Percy at getting heat? in this character <laughs> well man uh he was good he was good uh i never actually got to see percy live but I'm, I'm just going by the you know during that era and the von erics were a phenomenon but unless they you know you had to keep that phenomenon fresh because you were in a situation where they were in the sportatorium every friday night every saturday morning even memphis, uh, memphis was slightly different in that they were every monday night mid-south coliseum and then every saturday morning in the tv studio so it was a little different than it wasn't back-to-back days the tv studio only hold held about um 150 fans whereas the sportatorium for those saturday morning tapings was drawing you know was putting about 1500 people every saturday morning and every friday night so you'd have about the same audience this is how i recollect it you know uh actual figures may be a little different but my recollection was the business was on the upswing, largely due to the Eric Embry babyface turn, which people really bought into. Uh, Eric Embry, strangely enough, um, with a great crew of babyfaces, and we've talked about this in a previous episode, but you had Eric, you had Kerry, you had Jeff Jarrett, gentleman Chris Adams, Brickhouse Brown, uh, Jimmy Jack Funk turned babyface. You had a great babyface crew. Um, and... Uh, and but even even <clears throat> prior to that, the Von Erichs were super hot, and uh, they needed they needed something to keep them in the ring every Friday night and uh, and every Saturday morning. So you had to make hope that storylines connected, and I think uh, the inclusion of Percy Pringle uh, made sure they had a good connection rate. No doubt he was fantastic at his job and he's not just a manager. He's also working in the front office. He's going to even become a commentator. He's even going to help promote some of the house shows. Hey, he'd even work the uh, merchandise stand and write the programs. He's, uh, sort of having a, a Bruce Pritchard like experience where he's doing a little bit of everything. Is that the way you heard him talk about world class? Yeah. Because when I was in world class, he would call some of the matches I remember I had a really good sportatorium match with uh, Eric Embry. Uh, like I mentioned, he was the top baby face. At that point, I was only three and a half years in the business. Uh, it seemed like it took me forever to get there. But in retrospect, it was like the blink of an eye. 
And Eric told me, you call it out there, baby. So I, I, that was a big moment for me. And uh, Percy did the commentary for that one. So uh, he was an enjoyable presence for sure. And I, uh, I, like everyone else, enjoyed being around him. He managed a who's who here in this territory, including the missing link, Matt Bourne, who we know would go on to be a doink, mm-hmm. Buzz Sawyer, Eric Embry, the great Kabuki, the Dingo Warrior, Steve Austin, Ted Arcidi, Steve and Sean Simpson, Black Bart and Iceman King Parsons. Uh, what do you think a, uh, a young cactus Jack could that have worked with Percy? Yeah, it sure. Yeah, it sure would have. I mean, I was really happy to be there with, uh, Akbar at the t- by the time I got there, Akbar was really the only game in town when it came to heel managers, but I think Percy and I would have uh, had a good connection. And I also realized that I, I said that, uh, he, uh, he battled against Steve Austin. Uh, but I guess this was a case where he was also, he was managed at first turned, you know how these turns are, right? Yes. Yes. Jericho and I once passed time on a three hour drive simply by discussing, uh, big shows, heel turns. And, uh, we, uh, finished the ride and we were only halfway there. And that was 20 years ago. So guys do tend to men and women do tend to go back and forth. And that was, I guess the case with Percy. No doubt. Uh, you actually wind up being across the ring from Percy. Uh, I could find on three separate times, March 17th, 1989. It's the Simpson brothers and Percy Pringle taking on cactus Jack, Gary young and Skandar Akbar. Oh, they would happen a month later in Fort worth, Eric Embry and Percy Pringle, the third against cactus Jack and Skandar Akbar in that scaffold match. You yeah, about. there we go. Okay. Okay. And then the penalty uh, box match was in mesquite January. I'm sorry. July. Fourth, uh, Matt Bourne and Percy Pringle against Devastation Incorporated, which of course is you and Skandar. You wrote a, a big story about the scaffold match in your book. Can you tell us about your hesitation going into the match and having the match? And was Percy a part of that? Like, was he a calming sort, or is he the tor- site who's going to sort of give you uh, a little bit of shit about it and rib you a little bit? <clears throat> well, uh, Percy, I believe, was kind of terrified. Yeah, so I think we were commiserating. I was asked about it, I, not at one, not for one second did I say, "Hey, uh, is there a, a decent payoff attached to this?" And I didn't for a second like weigh my pros and cons <laughs> as an athlete or uh, a lack of being one. I, it was not until I hung up the phone that I was like, "Man." I don't know how I'm going to fare in there. Like uh, a big part of the scaffold match is being able to like keep yourself suspended, uh, you know, from a hanging position, even a pull-up position. So you're in complete control. And even, uh, you know, at my peak as an athlete, I maxed out in sixth grade gym class with four pull-ups. And that was before I was bottom heavy. So I was not a pull-up guy. Uh, And so I didn't have like, the main attribute you need to be in control of your own destiny there. I think um, guys who've been there will tell you the secret is you want to try to hang, be in control of yourself. And when you hit the mat, it's really important that your body kind of collapses, um, kind of like a, a, a paratrooper type of thing. And there have been a litany of injuries. I think Jim Cornette's knee first and foremost, but there's really no good way to uh, leave <laughs> that position uh, uh, dangling from the scaffold and hit. I mean, the, the, the percent, the, the, you know, the percentages go up dramatically in that type of match. And so I, I was, uh, I did leave with the broken wrist uh, and a good memory. Let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, the most famous part of his career is managing the undertaker. Right. But a lot of people don't know that before Paul bear managed the undertaker, Percy Pringle managed Texas red. Oh, so how about that? If you're watching on YouTube, you can actually see the, the future Paul bear rubbing the shoulders of the future undertaker. Unfortunately, he's going to be taking on Bruiser Brody that night. So it didn't go his way. <laughs> um, I think that. That may have actually been Undertaker's first match. It may have been his first match. 
with Brody kind of uh, giving him a rude, inter- or maybe they, you know, uh, he came he came back with what they saw enough in him with that first Brody match. I can't, I don't know for sure, but Brody was pretty rough on him because he realized he had a guy with no experience. And I guess that's uh, one sure way to make sure things look good is to, you know, lay that stuff in. Well said. I, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that, uh, I can't help, but think about the fantasy booking undertaker versus bruiser Brody in the WWF. Can you imagine how oh, kick ass that would have been? Ah, uh, Brody could add a whole host of, uh, great opponents. Uh, he left us in 88. Yeah. Imagine, uh, that, that undertaker, uh, character being red hot 91, 92, taking on Bruiser Brody. Yeah. It would have been something sure for sure. I know you voiced over the very first dark side of the ring about Bruiser Brody back when it was a pilot back before it was called dark side, et cetera, et cetera. But I, you and I've never spent a lot of time talking about Brody. He's a guy who had, you know, even the brawler award named after him. Yeah. He so he influenced a lot of guys. Was he somebody that you sort of mimicked style or borrowed from, or did you hold him in high regard? Talk to me about Bruiser Brody. Yeah. This is something I talked about on my last show. Um, the last, uh, the one man show, uh, have a nice day tour. Uh, I was having trouble with my punches as a Danucci student. Uh, so Brian Hildebrandt, who we've talked about on the show was best known to wrestling fans as referee Mark Curtis, but he was Jimmy Cornette's uh, right hand man in so many ways in Smoky Mountain. And he knew the business inside and out was an excellent in ring technician as well, often wrestling on independent shows as a uh, teenage mutant ninja turtle, told me, first of all, in the meantime, while I was working on my punches, <laughs> he was karate. <laughs> oh, my. <laughs> Talking about, like, to the throat, you know? Like, look how much yes. mileage Abdullah got with the one thrust, right? Yes, yes. So, and, and when Shawn Michaels, jumping ahead to 97, when Shawn Michaels uh, was hurt, and my goal was to get through those matches, Without him taking a single bump, brother, these two, boom, I would come in with the mandible claw, the fingers to the neck and the throat, and Sean sold it like a million bucks. So Brian said, use karate, uh, and while you are working your way through this phase, watch these punches thrown by Terry Funk and Bruiser Brody in this brawl in Tokyo. These are the best punches in the business. And so kind of serendipitous he gave me that one tape and not only did it have that amazing brawl with brody and funk but it also had uh, one of the very best tiger mask dynamite kid matches and it was through watching that tape constantly that i thought what if i were to uh take some of the aspects of the brody funk brawling style. I knew I didn't have the physical presence of a bruiser Brody, but I could take some elements of that. I knew I could not wrestle like dynamite kid, but I could take that attitude like of launching your own body as a weapon. And I would say the Brody, uh, funk brawling and the dynamite kid, uh, high impact style was like, kind of like, um, the uh you know the cross uh uh hybrid style that uh helped helped me immeasurably yeah without those guys i would just i i think i would have been lost so you we all borrow from each other right we all do it and the key is to put your own ingredients into this stew uh and i think i i did that but definitely Brody had a huge effect on me to the point where, uh, you know, Stan Hansen said that, it, you know, to watch me, you know, sell, I did it differently than Brody, but there were shades of it. He said, that's really quite a tribute to Frank. And I used to encourage uh, heels, especially who seemed lost, uh, to watch Brody matches and watch how he maximized everything, uh, that he could get almost as big a reaction by going up to the top rope and not coming off uh, as he would by coming off the top rope. And then that made the the move off the top later in the match or in another match even more meaningful. But he was a guy that got the most out of everything. 
uh, and just, uh, you know, he had that incredible spirit. And uh, in Japan especially, man, he, flour he flourished there with that the, the crowd that didn't care that they were in harm's way. And some of them wanted to be in harm's way. Some of them wanted to go home with, <laughs> with a punch or a mark from a chain to prove they'd been at a Brody match. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I gleaned quite a bit from Brody. And I'll go on the record saying, yeah, that was one of my mistakes is not accepting that uh that that voiceover job that later went to chris jericho but i uh yeah yeah i mean we could talk about dark side of the ring at another time but my my point my mindset was how can you possibly top that story right you know unless there's a lot of dying going on and i didn't <laughs> know honestly i thought i don't want to be involved in a show where someone's dying every week and right. I've gotten to really like and appreciate and be a big fan of Dark Side of the Ring. But at that time, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to be a part of something that dark. No, that makes sense. I mean, I think that's a natural hesitancy. A lot of folks had before they saw it. And even after seeing it, I know some folks say, oh, no good can come of this and all that yeah. jazz. But I think a lot of the creators, and I know you had a chance to meet Jevin, uh, Jason and Evan, and yeah, they have done a great job. And, um, they did a, a segment on the territories and we should talk about the end of world class here. It's going to start taking place and the Von Eric's eventually make a deal with Jerry Jarrett about ownership of the company. And there's a lot of, uh, politics involved in all of this. And I think this is the era where you're there, right? <laughs> I, yeah, I was there before, uh, Steve was there. I was, Steve was training when I was there. So they have a bunch of guys in there that weren't there at the time that I was, but yeah, uh, I remember trying to, Max Andrews had something to do. He was one of Jerry's, I don't know if he was Jerry's production guy, um, but I think he was cast as like the knight in shining armor trying to, uh, somehow uh, the story was told effectively enough that fans actually cheered when the world-class banner was torn down <laughs> by by Jarrett and uh and uh, Embry and I think Percy was part of that. That might have even been the photo uh, that you just put up there of the banner coming down and they turned it to USWA. So as we speak, the last time I saw both you and Grillo was at Jerry's uh, yep. service. And uh, man, part of the reason I'm, you know, I have such a debt of gratitude to Jerry Jarrett is that he actually purchased world class before I got there. So he was in a position, and this is so I was in that period where they were two separate entities owned by the same guy. And I think within uh, four to six months of me leaving there, Dallas became another part of the weekly Memphis route. It's like a 10 hour drive, but it became part of that route. And I think they had a, a, a bus that took the guys uh, from um, were from Memphis to. Uh, to uh to dallas um but jerry brought me and gary young on board and uh world class was a new lease on life for me because i was really down and you know, wrestling business can be really tough on younger guys especially you know i was a young a young man from the north coming into what was a southern territory and i was kind of i guess the feeling was costing someone like tojo yamamoto bookings by being a new guy in there so i wasn't you know, I, I spent a lot of time down because my first wrestling territory wasn't turning out to be what I hoped it would be. And then the uh, world class was a new lease on life. And uh, I really fell in love with the idea of traveling and being on the road and <clears throat> working regularly with great people. And I learned so much in such a short time in, uh, in world class. Well, sadly, eventually we know Dallas shuts down. The company goes defunct and this character debuts at the 1990 survivor series called the undertaker. He's managed by brother love here. And I'm sure we'll talk in great detail one day about the undertaker, but what'd you remember when you saw this debut of a new character and Hey, wait, I know that guy <laughs> now. Hey, since uh, we last did an episode, <clears throat> the uh, rivalries episode of Mankind and Undertaker is aired on A&E. Have you seen it? It was fantastic. I loved it. <clears throat> yeah, I'm pretty hard to please <clears throat> when it comes to my own stuff. And I was really happy with it. 
I think the only <clears throat> point of contention people could have is that it made the Hell in a Cell match look like a rematch of the uh, Buried Alive match when it actually took place a year and a half later. It was its own separate angle and not a hot angle at all. You know, it was really a cold angle. Uh, but you've only got an hour to tell that story. And I think right. more than any other rivalry, it's defined by that one match that sticks out in people's minds. And I was, man, it was so, Undertaker was so complimentary towards me and you could see and, uh, you know, feel the mutual respect there. And so I told this story saying, I remember a friend of mine from the University of Dallas who had met in my world-class days told me that she had a nephew who was eight or nine years old. He was a huge fan. And I, I was going to be in that area of central Pennsylvania. So I stopped by to watch the pay-per-view at this family's home. And when The Undertaker debuted, I was aware on one level that he was the same guy that I used to travel with and split rooms with. <laughs> but on another level, man, it wasn't him. It was like it was a new guy. Right. I don't know if I've ever you know, had that reaction to uh, an arrival of a new character uh, that had previously been known under another name. Uh, and it was just, it was, man, it was just incredible. That was such a winning hand. He came in and he was decimating, you know, established talent over talent. And uh, if there's a case, you know, ever a uh, textbook way to make somebody in one night uh, I mean, that's just the first the building block, but it's an important one. That was that, that was something that night. Can you give me in a nutshell the reason why the brother love undertaker marriage was so uh, when we say marriage was Russell speak for uh, partnership? Uh, why didn't that last longer? Why did Vince feel like they needed somebody else for that position? I think uh, Bruce wanted to come off the road and wanted to work out of the office more. Okay. So and that if, turned out, yeah, it turned out to be good for everyone. I love Brother Love, but I don't know if that was a great fit. Uh, I think they like the contrast of, you know, a lot of times you do have at a funeral service some sort of pastor type figure who does some speaking, and they <laughs> like maybe the contrast of white and black. And I get that, but ultimately we know it's not long for this world. It only lasts about six weeks, and then we see a new character debut. It's Percy Pringle, but now he's got dark hair and he's <laughs> called Paul Bearer. And listen, as a name, it's a little silly. It's a little tongue in cheek. But boy, it just works with an Undertaker character. It, it? it does. Now, I've never been a big fan of the, <laughs> of the names, the Isaac Yankum from Decatur, yes. Illinois. This was <laughs> to me, the exception that proved the rule. Uh, Paul Bearer. And it worked. It, we like we understood that this is a guy who's got dark circles painted under his eyes, right? Like they don't even look like real bags, but it worked. And, you know, on paper maybe it shouldn't have, but it it was exemplary in its execution. I mean, you're, hopefully you're taking a look at, at our YouTube version of the show because we've got some really fantastic photos here that complement the story. The name, a little silly, but uh, it works. But more importantly, now you see two guys that you knew pretty well on WWF TV. How happy were you to see these guys paired together and working for the WWF? I mean, that's the big time. Loved it. Loved it to the point where I had uh, one of my ultimate mark out moments. You've never heard me refer uh, derisively to anybody as a mark, right? No. I just, I, I don't think it's good to insult people who love what we do by calling them names. Right. I don't think that's healthy. Um, uh, but I, so the only time I use the term mark or mark out is towards myself. Right. Uh, when I turn 100% in into a fan. In the Santa world, we call it a Santa moment. In the wrestling, we call it a mark out moment. And I would say this qualifies because, so in 1990, I would have been 25 years old. Uh, I'm in world class and I see the hearse <laughs> that the Undertaker and Paul Bear used to actually be driven in a hearse for some period of time. I don't know how regular it was. I don't know how long the period lasted, 
but I see this hearse going through the drive through at McDonald's, at which point I get out of my car, proceed to chase the hearse, and I'm knocking on the, I'm knocking on the door like I'm a prepubescent David Cassidy fan in 1971. I'm like, it's me, it's Cactus Jack. And they rolled down the window. And we talked for a couple minutes, and then I saw him again and uh, saw them both again in 96. But, uh, man, that character had me hook, line, and sinker. I was such a big fan of it and never would have guessed back then that I would go on to have my most famous moments with both of them. Who would have thought, man? And uh, when you think about them as a pair, as a duo, that might be the best combination of wrestler manager of the nineties. No. Well, you have to remember that uh, cactus Jack and barbarian are in that mix too. <laughs> That's we did, and carrots. We did some good skits. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, it really was an iconic duo. Um, man, I think you could throw corny and the midnights in there. Uh, Paulie and a couple of his guys, but I think if you asked fans, uh, in the casual to die hard, uh, realm, you know, on the extreme end of, of die hard fans, they might have other answers, but I think casual to die hard beginning of die hard. I think they would pick, uh, Paul bearer and, uh, and, uh, undertaker as the most iconic duo. What do you think helped make him stand out so much? I mean, it, he definitely has a different look, right? He's not. Yeah doesn't look like Percy anymore. Now he's got the, the white foundation on. So he looks very, very pale and he's got the dark circles under his eyes and he's doing a different voice at times. And it's a pretty drastic change from the Percy character. Yeah. I think, you know, guys like Bobby Heenan, he would get very involved in the matches and do a lot of physical stuff. Percy almost rarely does. And when he does, there's almost like a comedic element to it. Right. Yeah. Look, this should not have worked. I'm going back to say how much I loved it, but how on paper it should not have worked. This is, that's not the tail end. It's in the era of the vocations. Like Kevin Nash says, a guy was a, he wasn't a character. He was a thing. He was a job. He was a, yeah. Yeah, a vocation. A, yeah, vocation. So Paul Bearer is a funeral manager. He's using the name that usually doesn't get over and usually personally irks me. By the way, how much uh, character is that piece of wrapped furniture in the corner giving to this camera shot? I thought it was a piece of art. And, you know, I don't know what these <laughs> rich people do. I was like, that looks like art or something. I got to um, okay. So um, uh, repeat the question, please. Well, we're just talking about how it's a different presentation and yeah. it's almost a little comedy when he does get involved physically. It's different it than what the company's doing. There's a comedic element that probably helped with the longevity. Uh, Paul, at the, that point, less was more when it came to hearing from The Undertaker. He kept that aura of mystery uh, all around him. Paul Bearer did the talking. Sometimes it was funny. And then it was juxtaposed with the very serious nature of what The Undertaker did inside the ring. He would only break character when we got to be 10,000 miles from the United States. And that was only in the period of time when uh, there was the, the internet was in its infancy. There was no YouTube. So the idea of Undertaker doing the Chief J Strongbow war dance uh, would not hit American shores. But it was a morale lifter for sure for people who were away from their family. And, you know, we're in a kind of dangerous situation when you're getting bomb threats uh, towards your boss. You needed a little of that spirit lifting. <clears throat> and that's what Undertaker supplied for us. Well, we uh, we love this character so much. One of the more iconic things that was synonymous with uh, Paul Bear, besides the crazy facials, is the big oh yes. Do you have an oh yes for us? Oh yes. I didn't think I did, but I think I do. Now I think I do. Everyone had one at one point. Yeah, it was, uh, man, it was, it was a catchphrase. Oh, yes. He would, he would end almost every promo with that. And it was, it was good. Talk to me about the presentation here. You know, we've got some different stuff in terms of the way we're going to evolve the character. He starts with uh, a bit of an angle with Jake the Snake Roberts. 
He's involved with the ultimate warrior, but then he turns baby face by turning on Jake. Was there anything that really stood out to you about these characters before you're there? Are you taking a look and thinking, Oh, I could do something with that. Or I like that they're doing this or, well, that's not really for me. Well, keep in mind at the time this was happening, I was on the road, um, a lot, you know, a couple hundred days a year with uh, WCW, maybe 240 if you factor in the, the travel, somewhere around there. Uh, so I wasn't getting to see as much of the product as I would have liked. This is uh, There were VCRs, but I don't, they were kind of few and far between. Um, and I, if there were, I wasn't in the ha habit of taping the Superstar show, which is really their main show. It shows you how much the business has changed that the syndicated show was much bigger than Tuesday Night Titans, which would be the, the cable show uh, on Tuesday nights on, on USA. Um, so I would catch up with things every now and then. And I think it speaks to just how good, the how sinister the Jake Roberts character was when The Undertaker could turn babyface off of him. Well, we know what's coming. It's going to be one of the more iconic runs in wrestling history. And then you joined the company in 1996. Do you just pick yeah. up right where you left off with Mr. Bill Moody? Yeah, exactly. Um, I come in, I guess Undertaker had been one of my proponents. Kevin Nash had been a proponent. I think, you know, my guess, uh, never proven. And I never asked Mark partially because I don't want to get an answer that's contrary to the answer I've had in my head, which was that I think he just got tired of working with guys who were either taller or heavier than him, you know, during the course of that run, with the exception of Jake and Snuka and maybe three or four others. Um, up until, uh, well, I'm also, there was only, the streak wasn't even a streak then, it was only six people, but he had been featured with guys like Bundy, Kamala, Giant Gonzalez, so if they weren't taller than him, they were bigger in girth than him. And I think he felt like he had more left in the tank. And I think he, that was about the time that he started shifting gears. So one of the clips they showed with Mankind and Undertaker was Undertaker really bringing the offense. And the commentary was that I don't think we've ever seen Undertaker move this fast. So he was ready for a transition. And so even though I know these guys, it is strange that they are those characters, if that makes sense. Uh, they are the guys I spent time with on the road in previous incarnations, but it's almost like they're different people. Um, but I did, you know, the friendships uh, picked up right away. And uh, I, oh, we didn't even mention that I actually uh, babysat Paul Pear's children on two or three occasions when I was in world class, I think I overheard him saying that he was wishing that he and uh, his wife, Diane, could just have a, a you know, a night out. And uh, I volunteered my babysitting services and I was excellent. Uh, I think I took them to the movies on at least one occasion. And uh, yeah, I've got that going for me. Very few superstars can say they, ba maybe no other superstar can say they uh, uh, babysat uh, Paul Bear's children. We, uh, we've talked a lot about the undertaker and, and your run when you first came into the company, but we haven't spent a lot of time talking about Paul's transition as a character for managing the undertaker for six years here. to now he's going to be managing you. Right. Do you think at the time Paul was worried about his spot or how this pairing with you and a new talent could work because he's been enjoying a lot of success with the undertaker and I could see how guys would be careful about what does this mean for my spot? Do you think he had any concerns? Like well, that? let's just pause for a moment because it appears to me in this photo, if you concentrate long enough that there is a deltoid muscle to be found and oh, I see it. the baby uh, makings of a bicep cap. So uh, that's a good look for me. Uh, and a good look, let me I just say this, Mick, if you keep that up one day, you could look as good as Bo Dallas. Almost as good as Bo Dallas. Almost as good as Bo Dallas. <laughs> that's, a, that's my son, Mickey Foley, for the uninitiated. Seeing dad in a rare shirtless selfie pose, I thought he was asleep. Told me if I kept working on it, I could look almost as good as Bo Dallas. <laughs>
if I kept working hard, I could look almost as good as the guy with the worst physique in the company. Um, but look, if Paul had any, um, if he had, he had any hesitation or concerns, he didn't let me know about it. I think it would be unusual if he did not because it was working. I mean, it was, it had maybe hit a plateau, um, but there were some, pre there were a couple of really big uh, heavy hitters who were kind of warning me um, that this uh, thing with The Undertaker wasn't going to go well uh, for me or in general. Uh, and I took the chance and uh, proved them wrong. And uh, I could not have done it without uh, Paul Bearer playing such a pivotal role. And when he, the decision was made for him to turn, I don't think I learned about it. But, oh man, that, that arm isn't looking too good in that photo. Man, looks like Foley needs to hit the gym now, pronto. Um, but when he turned on The Undertaker, man, it was, it was heavy. And it was uh, very meaningful. And I felt in a real way that like we were off to the races. And this was clearly a sign uh, that the company was behind me when they have uh, Paul and Paul Bear did some of his best work against uh, against the Undertaker, not only with me but with uh, Kane and Kane and I teamed up for a while. And I'm really proud that there was just the three of us that he managed. It was Undertaker, it was Kane, it was Paul Bearer. And uh, man, can I skip ahead to? Uh, I mean, yeah, I have please do. You know, we uh, we know uh, from the onset it's been 15 years since uh, we lost uh, we lost Paul Bearer, and when I got the news and found out that uh, he was the service going to be in Montgomery, uh, I checked the flight. Man, you know, it was like fourteen hundred dollars one way. I was in Indianapolis, um, and that's that man. There's a lot of money, and so I checked my. Uh, rental car and the rental car was only like an additional thirty dollars to drop in <laughs> mobile as opposed or maybe to drive on back i was living in the florida pan i, was, I don't know where the heck i was living at that time uh it it, it made financial sense and I, I i turned on the gps and it said something like eight eight hundred miles or 700 miles and i got in the car i only had three cds and uh I made, I made it there and I was so glad that, uh, Glenn was there. Taker was there. So the three guys that he managed, uh, were all there to pay their respects. And I could see a few of the old timers trying to hit up undertaker for, uh, uh an appearance at cauliflower alley club. And, uh, we conferenced and I decided to take one for the team and that I would be the guy to represent, uh, the trio and go out there to Vegas and, uh, you know, honor, honor Uncle Paul with an award. Probably more your speed than Undertaker's speed. Fair to say. <laughs> yeah, 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 for for sure. But again, it was really nice to see. Uh, I think it makes his uh, managerial uh, career remarkable for only uh, managing three guys as that character. And uh, that all three of us stayed pretty, uh, pretty tight with them until the end. Go out of your way to check out our SummerSlam 96 episode. That's where we talk about the heel turn where Mr. Paul Bear is going to join Mick Foley as mankind. We also covered him being in the shark cage above the ring at Survivor Series 96. <laughs> and he even manages both you and Vader for a short lived tag team oh. run for the big baby face turn. How did Vader get along with, uh, with Paul, with Mr. Moody? I don't remember. Honestly, I don't remember. Uh, man, is that a shame? But how short lived was it? Was he in our corner when we did at WrestleMania 97? I mean, he was. Yes. Okay, man. It's, you know, we've talked a little bit in the past, but uh, these amazing memories and that you were only able to hold on to the things that really worked or really didn't. So I think that uh, I'm in the majority with wrestlers who remember things that went terribly wrong and things that went wonderfully right. And if you don't have a recollection, it's a sign that it was okay. Um, so the fact that I didn't even know that means it was okay. 
it wasn't a disaster. The Vader mankind pairing never really had the payoff it could have um, if they'd gone back to the, the ear. For those of you who don't know, there we go. Uh, that happened in a match with Vader. We could have played off that, but um, I, I'm sorry. I, I guess it was okay, but like you said, it was it was short lived. Well, he's an invaluable part of your run here, and there's even an idea that we should mention here that didn't happen, but apparently it was an idea that was floated by Jim Cornette for a story between you, Sable and Mark Merrow at WrestleMania. What do you think that would have looked like? Oh man. Uh, yeah. Jimmy threw, threw it my way. I don't remember. It was the execution that I, I was, I was envious of Mark and the, he'd come in with the first contract. And I think he'd signed like, uh, within a week of when I signed for nothing more than the opportunity. And, uh, man, I use that as fuel. And I know Steve Austin did too. I've, uh, since, you know, I've, I've apologized to Mark for making him the bad guy in my head for doing nothing more than what anyone else would have done. And he's an amazing man who, uh, has inspired so many people with his, uh, talks. He's one of the best lecturers in the entire country and sable was red hot like we probably could have made it work we probably could have made it work and i don't know what uh, i just know i went from um you know i'm going back to the september um match with Shawn michaels which was originally slotted in as me and uh me and mark uh and i don't you'll have to refresh my memory when it comes to the uh i, I do i I do know that we talked about the fact that Corny, I said, I know Cactus, it's not great. We just want to get you a spot at WrestleMania. And I said, hey, if it's between <laughs> getting a spot and having a spot that's not good, I'd rather not be on the show. And that's still the way I felt. You know, I still feel like, uh, you know, you get to create your own WrestleMania moments. I was the only guy that ever uh, pointed, you know, after I won a match, I would point to the fast lanes. <laughs> I love that. I would put it in your house sign. No, no. Tremendous. <laughs> Tremendous. I love you. What a great line. Well, we know that eventually you guys get put back together. Um, you transition back to Paul in 1998 when you briefly become mankind again. We'll be covering that as we just march through all of 1998 this year here on the show. But you wrote this in your book. Two weeks after the cell match with Taker, I was given interview time to hype an Undertaker rematch on the Federation's new Sunday Night Heat television show on the USA Network. I went out with Mike in hand and in my old ECW fashion, tried to make the fans feel what it was like to have my career nearly end. Within 48 hours, I had gone from kissing my or my daughter kissing me on the cheek at Santa's Village because you're a good man to having a tooth sticking out of my nose. What I got from the crowd was apathy and disrespect. As I poured out my heart, fans were yelling obscenities and filling the rings with garbage. It was the first time I clearly felt that the new Federation attitude era had passed me by. Cool guys were in. Mick Foley was out. Catchphrases were, it were in interviews that were required. Let me try that again. Catchphrases were in interviews that required an audience to think we're out. I came back to the dressing room and I was livid. Paul bear was the first one to come in after me. And as such, he caught the brunt of my anger. Damn it purse. I don't know why I'm doing this anymore. These people don't give a F unless it's a catchy phrase or a set of boobs. I cleaned up some language. there. Yeah, you did. Uncle Paul tried to calm me down. Mommy. He said, it's not you. It's the end of a long night and they're tired. I wasn't buying it. They're not tired. They're buttholes purse. And you know what? I'm a butthole too, for even giving a damn a long time passed before I felt good about performing again. This is, um, real life here. And you're sharing that it's isn't just quote unquote character work or knee slap or ha ha's right. You had your real feelings hurt about trying to be real with the audience at a time where they just weren't in the mood for that. Right. Yeah. Um, it's funny because I've said uh, before a couple times that if the cell match had taken place during the uh, social media era, it probably would have um, 
peaked for about two days, trended for two days, and been largely forgotten. And instead, it was like this snowball slowly going downhill. And as it went down, it, it, it gathered momentum um, and really captured people's imaginations. But in the immediate aftermath, I don't think my character had ever been more dead. Uh, in the 20, uh, 20 Years of Hell so, uh, one man show, I talked about how we'd thrown a lot at people in the course of this was um, <clears throat> just a little over two years. I'd gone from Mankind to, um, to Dude Love to Cactus Jack, to all three simultaneously, to a corporate dude love, to evil, to back to Cactus Jack, to corporate dude love, to corporate mankind, and it, it wasn't working. It wasn't working. When they booked me in that match with Undertaker, at, uh, I was so surprised because I knew the character uh, had hit a snag. And I, as you can see by the verbiage, I wasn't sure I could undo it. And uh, there was an awful lot of goodwill that accrued over the months, and especially over the years and even decades stemming from that match. But in the immediate aftermath, yeah, I remember being at a signing in Fall River, Massachusetts, maybe a week, uh, two weeks at the most. Sable's line was about four times longer than I was. And, uh, you know, I, I I was scrambling. I was, first of all, I realized I couldn't do the things that I uh, had been doing on a regular basis. Uh, I was looking at my career being over soon, and I, you know, I did not know how to pick up the pieces. I love that you're vulnerable in your books like this. Was was Paul always your sounding board, or just in this particular instance? Yeah, he frequent frequent you know a lot of times uh, we had reason to celebrate because things had gone really well and we loved doing those promos uh but in trying to see and you know once i took off the mask even though i had been cactus jack i had been dude love and jim ross talked about mickey foley to me once i took off the mask under the wreckage <laughs> the, the cell wreckage uh that character became more of a real guy instead of a character in my head. And I tried to fill him out as such. And it was an uphill, it was really was an uphill struggle. If you were to look at both uh, WWE and WCW at that time, uh, things were geared so heavily towards catchphrases and cadences. And I remember saying to Shawn Michaels, I said, you know what? I said, Eventually, this is Sean, I believe, after it was maybe his first return. At, it may have been the day of or after Hell in a Cell. You see, that may have been his first time back since he stepped away after losing to uh, uh, Steve at uh, WrestleMania um, 1998. I said, Sean, there's going to come a time when our fans, when our fans are going to require more and those and a lot of the like the newest fans the fad fans they're going to hop off the train so the people who are going to keep the company alive are going to be seen historically as the people who couldn't draw when in fact they'll be the people keeping the company together um because i was really struggling uh sean went out and he did his promo and he mentioned hell in a cell and he came back and said to me, if those guys aren't going to mention it, he pointed to the announcers on TV. He said, I thought at least I would, because it wasn't in the cold open. There was no mention of the match in the opening minutes of the show. And Sean was the first person to bring it up. So, like I said, it was a, I know this is supposed to be about Paul Bearer, but it's uh, almost impossible to separate, you know, Paul and Mankind and Undertaker from that match. And Paul was the guy helping me as my support system when I felt like I was floundering in its aftermath. So by now you know that Mick and I have spent a lot of time talking about some of these death matches and some of these bloody wars that he had. But you probably also know that that blood was intentional. You see, nobody wants to get cut accidentally, but unfortunately a lot of us do it. If you're using a cheap razor, you're getting those nicks, those cuts, that irritation. 
and I got to tell you, I got pretty annoyed with that whole subscription razor concept a few years ago. I found they just kept stacking up. What I enjoy most about Henson shaving is that it doesn't feel like a gimmick. It feels old school. Seriously, just the actual blade handle itself. Dude, it's metal. It's not some cheap piece of plastic that's going to break on you or frustrate you. This is like, I mean, I'm not saying it's going to last a lifetime, but it feels substantial. It feels like something our grandparents would have used. And at the same time, man, you get a whole pack of these straight razors. Dude, this is old school, but here's what's cool about it. And here's why I believe that you got to meet Henson shaving. They're a family owned aerospace parts manufacturer that's made parts for the international space station and the Mars Rover. And now they're bringing that same technology and engineering to your shaving experience. You see, I've learned that razor blades are like diving boards. The longer the board, the more the wobble, the more the wobble, well, the more nicks, the more cuts, the more scrapes. You see, a bad shave isn't a blade problem, it's an extension problem. So by using aerospace grade CNC machines, Henson makes razors that extend just 0 0.0013 inches, which is less than the thickness of a human hair. That means a secure and stable blade with a vibration-free shave. It's also got a clog-free design. You see, this razor has built-in channels to evacuate the hair and cream, which makes clogging virtually impossible. Seriously, Henson Shaving wants the best razor, not the best razor business. Let me explain. There's no plastic. There's no subscriptions. There's no proprietary blades. There's no planned obsolescence. The Henson Razor works with standard old-school dual-age blades, but it gives you that that new age, that new school tech. I mean, dude, these folks have made stuff for space. You darn right they can make stuff for your face. And once you own a Henson razor, it's only like three to five bucks a year to replace the blades. I'm a big believer in this. I was overwhelmed with the value. Seriously, you're gonna get more blades than you can imagine. In my first shave, I have to admit, I was a little intimidated. I haven't worked with a straight razor like this before, but dude, it was easy and I felt like a badass when it was done. I'm going to tell you, the design is incredible. The durability is awesome. It's super affordable. My buddy Cassio Kid came over to watch the Royal Rumble and I had told him about the razor before and I said, hey man, I got to show this to you. And I showed him the blade. I showed him the razor. It's, it's something you got to see. I recommend it. It's the most manly thing you can do today. It's time to say no to subscriptions and say yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Visit HensonShaving.com forward slash Foley to pick the razor for you and use code Foley and you'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just make sure you add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades when you head to H-E-N-S-O-N-S-H-A-V-I-N-G.com slash Foley and use the promo code Foley hensonshaving.com forward slash Foley. So listen, let's talk about what's next here for you guys. But before we talk about, you know, your, your travels, once you guys are, are back together in 1998, I do want to know, you know, when it comes to bouncing ideas off of someone, I get venting frustration, but creatively would Paul help you with creative? Would you bet? Hey, what about this? What do you think about that? Is that something you could do with Paul? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you'd be foolish not to bounce it off a seasoned veteran. Hey, can I point out some breaking news? We'll break it on this show. Please do. So we're talking about the cell and I chose to go on natural without the uh, denture. Uh, the blow I took when I came through the cage was so severe that not only did it knock out these uh, two teeth here, it also did a number on the teeth around it. And this one, one of them, this one here, is getting super loose. So eventually those two teeth will have to go, which puts the total number of teeth uh, ultimately knocked out in that one match up to four. And at wow. that point, um, that's not a good look. The, I think you'd argue this is not a good look either. Uh, the top teeth, good look. Uh, as my son Huey put it like uh, seven years ago, he goes, Dad, don't take this the wrong way. And we all know that nothing yes. good can come of a sentence that begins with don't take this the wrong way. But no. he said, uh, you used to look kind of cool with your top teeth missing. missing. Now you look like a crack addict. And oh. I, said, I said, son, I believe you're thinking of a meth addict, but I get your point. 
but it's not a cool look. And having two more gone is not a cool look at all. And uh, so when I see uh, Dr. Britt Baker, I think I will see her next weekend in Louisiana at the Comic-Con. We will seriously discuss the whens and hows of having all the Foley teeth. That'll be seven, uh, four on the bottom, three on the top, uh, replaced in a, in a permanent type of way. Are you going to let Dr. Britt Baker do that for you? We've been talking about it for a couple of years uh, wow. so now, but now it's getting to that point where I really don't like wearing the denture. I only wear it, you know, for public things. It's not comfortable. I can't chew with it. And uh, I, I do. I mean, I like the missing teeth on top, but even that that's been uh, 33 years now or 32 and a half years since I lost them. So it might be time to make that change. Man, I can't, uh, I can't wait to hear your dentist story with, uh, a real, a real wrestling dentist, not as a No, no. Yeah. Remember when I shocked the world with that? Uh, I don't know if you saw it, but I put out a top secret, uh, video. It was only about 20 seconds long and I confided with the world that Dr. Britt Baker might be the greatest wrestling dentist of them all. And uh, I heard it from the Isaac Yankum fans, believe me, brother. But I think most people agree, Dr. Baker, best wrestling dentist. No doubt. Hey, let's talk about those creative ideas that you would run past Paul or he would run past you. Do you remember pitching a rather out there idea and him saying, I don't know about that one, Mick? Well, I don't think he was real big on the idea of coming off the top of the cell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But you have a great promo guy, a very different type of promo than I did, but still a guy uh, who clearly knows how to uh, get over with a crowd and he's seeing me struggle. And I think his advice was, to, you know, keep going. Don't, don't, don't become the catchphrase guy. Don't become what it is you hate. Um, stick with it. Like you're going to win out in the end. And that was some really valuable uh feedback because I did end up having, you know, some of my best, um, promos in the months and years that followed that. Let's talk a little bit about, um, the Scranton shows. I think you had a, a fun story with Paul there at the Scranton show. There's a reason why WWE has not been back to the Scranton, uh, CYS. It's a Catholic youth center. And this is a story when someone asked me like at one of my shows during the Q and a, favorite Paul Bearer story. Uh, this is my go-to story because it's, it, to me, it was so much fun. Uh, Jack Lonzo was the, uh, he was uh, the agent. Uh, I think they call them producers now, but they used to be known as agents. And he knew the CYS was really concerned about the attitude era and the language. So he went around to just about every WWE superstar and Al Snow. <laughs> oh my, listen to you. <laughs> Hey, can, can we, next time I bring that up, I'll give you the Iggy and you guys can put a drum, a rim shot in post. Yep. Okay. Gorilla will have one of those ready. <laughs> and Al Snow and warn them about the language, but he didn't go to me because mankind didn't use any bad language. And we get out there. Spray and the CYS was a great venue as far as atmosphere. But it was a I mean, 2,000, 2,500 seater. So it wasn't a great show for financial restitution, but we all had fun. Uh, the very first time I went to the CYS, I heard Davey Boy laughing. He was like holding his mouth. He was laughing so hard. And I saw he was laughing. at was Owen kind of putting on a show for the fans, crossing the ring in like three giant steps. And I was so baffled because Owen was so awful and I knew he was a great worker. And then I see uh, Davy Boy laughing, and I can drop an f bomb if it's said in Davy's accent, right? Yes, and please like, do. Oh, he's, oh, he's too much. He's too fucking much, you know. And I look in there, and Owen was putting on a show, so it was the type of place you could have some fun, uh, like a, just a great atmosphere for. I don't know if any independents run it or not, or maybe they've had their fill because of my decision to delve across that, that bridge to the bad language land. Uh, Billy Gunn and Road Dog were the tag team champions, I think. And they did their ladies and gentlemen, boys, boys and girls of all ages, D-Generation X probably means to you. 
tag team champions of the world. And then Billy goes, if you're not down with that, we got two words for you. He held the microphone out because 2,500 people saying suck it is so much better than one person saying suck it. Yes. And as soon as he said it, I reacted uh, in, in he literally, literally to those words. And I got on the microphone and proceeded to say the word suck it in every conceivable way. I was going, Uncle Paul, I don't want to suck it. Please don't make me suck it. And it was just a succession of suck it, suck it, suck it. And when we got back to the uh, after the show, Jack Lonza, he, his head was down. He was shaking his head and he said, we will never be welcome in the CYS again. And as far as I know, we never have. And I was the guy who cost us that building. Oh, my. Yep. So that was it. Don't Please don't make me suck it. I don't want to suck it. Uh, now a new shirt. Uh, you can check that out in our shirt store. Please <laughs> no, please. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, uh, you know, we've heard a lot of people described, man, he had such a good mind for the business. Would you, would you classify Paul as one of those guys? Oh yeah, for sure. And I think he had, he had Vince's ear. And I think he had Bruce's ear. And, uh, when Paul spoke up, it was some, he was somebody you listened to. Um, he came back, you know, with a different look, uh, that we see, uh, for those of you who are following us on uh, YouTube. Um, and then he, he came back with his uh, kind of his natural colored hair, which would be a blondish, uh, and uh, had some of his best success uh, with the Brothers of Destruction with that look. Um, and uh, he, yeah, he was uh, a wealth of knowledge and uh, experience and somebody that we look to, somebody who was fun to be around. Um, he had his cranky moments too, but uh, by and large, a really uh, uplifting presence on the road. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the turn in the Paul Bear character. He's going to reunite with The Undertaker for the Ministry of Darkness. And this is a lot less comedy. His looks a little different, but now there's sacrifices and putting people on symbols, as Bruce would say. Others might call it a crucifixion. Um, did did you have a chance to talk with Paul about this? I know this is a rather controversial era for the undertaker. It's smack dab in the middle of the attitude era. So we're trying all sorts of craziness and outside right. of the box stuff. But do you think Paul was hesitant to do any of this creative or was he gung ho? I can't remember. Honestly, if I told you I'd be lying and we don't want to do this on the show, uh, so I don't remember. I, d you know, I think this was the Paul Bear who had less to do because Vince was the head of the corporate ministry, and there was Shane, and it was it was a really um, uh, the show was get, getting a little dark, and I've, you know, in years past, I've said that was why it was perfect for my time as commissioner because I had the ability to lighten things up a little bit lighten the mood because it was coming off a dark, uh, very serious uh, period on top. And uh, I liked it. Uh, they did a lot of stuff that was uh, out there and controversial, but I don't recall ever discussing with Uncle Paul, you know, any misgivings about it. Let's talk um, a little bit about the, uh, the, the character shift, because it's more than just, you know, the undertaker's got a different character. He's not going to be with maybe that little hint of comedy anymore. Do you think he enjoyed this version of Paul bear as much as the OG or not as much? Probably not. Yeah. I mean, I know I wouldn't have, right. I think, uh, you know, when you've been around a while, you realize it's a marathon, not a sprint. Um, you take the hand you're dealt and you do the best you can with it. And I think that's what he did with this, this character. He knew he'd have another day to be more flamboyant and more uh, verbal. And I think he just realized this was part of the journey. And also, I think if you're being realistic, you realize that uh, there are not many managers anymore. Um, and that you do, you do the best with the hand you're dealt. 
Uh, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about the, the last great Paul bear moment. He's going to return after your epic 10 man tag match. It's you, the rock too cool and Rikishi against DX and the radicals. And he's going to come on stage for his return with Kane. I think this is probably the last time you guys are sort of paired up together in any sort of segment. Is that the way you remember it? I, I don't know, but man, does he look good with that red blazer? And the Fu Manchu mustache. So changing things up just a little bit. Kane's look changed uh, several times over the years. Uh, and they were, man, they were a great pair together. Because, again, Kane was a guy that did not speak a lot in the earlier incarnations. Uh, and did not until he uh, revealed uh, his real face underneath the mask. At which point he became a lot more uh, verbal. But uh, that was a fun time, and man, that, uh, you know, Paul meant so much. They, they, there's no way that character Kane works coming out of the box without that storyline, which was some of Paul's very best work. I mean, the conversation he had with Jerry Lawler backstage where, you, you know, camera is caught eavesdropping, uh, Jerry and Paul talking about the real nature of uh, uh, Kane's <laughs> lineage, and it just came across as being so legit that to this day, I have people coming up and asking me, uh, you know, after they ask if it hurt, if I got thrown off the cell, what it was like to team up with The Rock. They then ask if Kane and Undertaker were real brothers. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, it is. It's... But that story was so well told, especially by Paul, like he did, he did a lot, you know, his, most of his stuff was larger than life. Uh, but when it came time to, uh, to, when the moment was right, he was very down to earth and very believable with that aspect of the character. I think as the story goes, Bruce Pritchard got into an Uber or something like that a few years ago. And, uh, the driver recognized him as being the former brother love. And he mentioned, oh yeah. And my dad is the undertaker. So of course that got Bruce's attention. Like, well, I've met the undertaker and never met you and <laughs> the rest of his family. I don't think, but Hey, he is tall. He does have red hair. <laughs> Maybe. So as Bruce is sort of going through this in his head and entertaining it, the guy casually mentions, yeah, and my uncle is Kane. <laughs> so that's what Bruce knew. Okay, never mind. I have to put no thought into this. That's man. a great story. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, eventually, Paul is uh, taken off the road to serve as a road agent, a stage manager, and even talent scout before he's released in 2002. I know that at this point, you guys' paths have, have just taken you in different places in life, but I know that he felt a certain type of way about being let go from the deal with the yeah. WWE. Did you have any contact with him? Did you reach out when you heard he was released or what's the nature of that relationship then? And did you guys discuss his release? Yeah. I, you know, wow. Yeah. 12 years, is a long time, uh, to be a manager with uh, top programs. And I don't think Paul was looking at the glass half full at that time. Um, I do remember, you know, he gave an interview where he said, all that glitters is not gold, my friend. Um, but with that being said, you know, we all jump at the opportunity to come back. If someone tells me their pulse doesn't quicken when they see the two zero three area code right up on their phone to this day, it's still, it's just, a, a, you know, like a visceral reaction. I don't know if visceral is the right word there, but it is, uh, get the blood like, going. Yeah, it does. Um, and he would come back. So I can't, I'm getting my years mixed up here. We did keep in touch. He did come to see me when uh, I was in Mobile with w, with uh, uh, TNA. So we remain good friends. I don't think, I think if Paul had known that he would come back in a major way and that, oh my God, you know, that his death would be a big part of the build of uh, CM Punk and Undertaker. Uh, that he might have seen things differently. Now, it's hard to say, you know, how someone would want their character treated after they're gone. Uh, but if I had to guess, I would say he'd be really happy that he was uh, used in a very respectful way 
as part of the fuel for that, uh, you know, that promotional fire with Punk and, and uh, Undertaker. And uh, I think the major part of a big episode of Raw was uh, dedicated to uh, being a tribute to uh, Mr. Moody. Um, but it hurts when you get let go. Uh, it hurts. It hurts, you know. Um, so uh, the independent scene was not then what it is now. Um, uh, I guess you could argue whether or not he'd be able to use that character uh, name. But uh, yeah, t but 12 years again is a long time to be gainfully employed uh, in a top position in the company. No doubt. And we know he comes back. Uh, he does make a brief appearance for TNA and then he comes back and, uh, he gets gastric bypass Dylan. Um, he's even going to be a part of WrestleMania 20. He's going to be in the undertaker's corner for his match with Kane. And I'm sure for fall for Paul to get one more shot like this and get one more WrestleMania payday and to be on the grand stage, he had to be thrilled with this. You were a part of WrestleMania 20. Oh yeah. I was, yeah, teamed up. I can't remember the guy's name. Uh, the Rock. Yeah, that's it. Uh, with The Rock to take on Evolution. And, uh, yeah, just two years later, uh, he's, yeah, he's back in a major way uh, and would later come back again uh, several times uh, before we lost him. We, uh, we should mention that... Um the gastric bypass is a, is a big deal for him personally. And he would write a lot about it. Did you guys have discussions about his weight and how it would fluctuate and his desire for the surgery at all? I don't know. It seems, I uh, mean, you know, I was when, uh, when I was in a lot of pain, I soothed it by eating and my, uh, you can see in the, you know, the different clips, my weight would go up 280 to 320, somewhere around there. Um, so uh, weight was always a concern for me as well. I mean, I'm at a point now where, you know, we're doing the Foley weight loss challenge as soon as I come to the studio next week with my jumbo scale, which I do have. Um, and, uh, if mother nature is not going to work with me a little bit, if my metabolism has been affected, I, I do have the long-term COVID, which, uh, you know, really reduced and has still reduced my energy levels. I'm going to see about going to a weight loss clinic. Um, but if none of that works, I mean, the bypass could be an option. So that was a big deal for Paul. He lost over a hundred pounds that way. I believe, do we know the actual figure? I don't know the total number, but I know that he lost quite a bit of weight. And he was constantly drinking the jugs of water. And I believe he was on the treadmill an hour a day. So he wasn't just relying on modern medicine. He was working hard and, he was pretty diligent, but man, it, I think he lost the weight naturally and then it came back. That's just, ah, that's just one of the unfortunate scientific facts is that if you are prone to obesity, uh, it's a light, it really is a lifelong struggle. Um, and uh, he, I've, you know, it's been a struggle for me. It was a struggle for him. Uh, for, I'd say, mil you're not exaggerating. You say millions of people struggle with, uh, yeah. with their weight. Um, we're all big men, me, you, and Grillo. Uh, yeah. I'm proud of it to some extent, but I don't need to be this proud of it. You know, I can be proud right. of it. Largesse, uh, you know, at 270 uh, instead of well, well, well north of 300 at this point. But anyway, let's get back to Paul. Not my weight loss journey, but his. Well, we know he's going to have various roles uh, after this WrestleMania 20 shot. He'll be buried alive in a concrete crypt by The Undertaker, and he would return again and turn on Taker for Kane one last time. We'd even work with Edge and Randy Orton later on before Kane rolls him into a freezer <laughs> and effectively ends the on-air character. I mean, it's, it's been kind of fun all the different ways we can try to figure out how we're going to kill Paul this week. Let's put him in concrete. Let's put him in the freeze. I mean, <laughs> right. yeah, that's really, that's, a, that's great imaginative stuff. And when you say he worked with, uh, edge and Orton, it just shows you what a vital part of the company. You know, he was so well known and beloved that he could help out in a few that he was really on the periphery of. 
Um, and that just speaks again to how, uh, you know, loved his beloved, his character was. We should, uh, mention that he had some nice words to say about you going into the hall of fame in 2013 quote. I love him dearly. I had so much fun managing him when he was mankind because we was going against the undertaker. We just had so much fun because he wore that mask, you know, that covered half of his long hair and that mask and all that. And we were just like kids out there all the time. And I was the only one that could ever make the undertaker laugh and he could be laughing and nobody ever knew it. And the same with Mick Foley, we would be out there and we all got paid to do this. I've been around all around the world, performed in all 50 States, 28 countries. And I got a paycheck every week. Yeah. Man, little note here. That brings up, um, I think my favorite part of my hall of fame induction speech was where I talked about how every night I was with Paul, the, uh, the gong would go off. Uh, so every eyeball in the arena went to that entrance where Undertaker would be emerging and Paul Bear would roll up his shirt sleeve. I've got some hairy arms, you know, and Paul's hair would be standing on end and then I would show him my arm and my hair would be standing on end. And so it's like Paul says, like, this is an honor. Like every night I was out there with the undertaker was an honor and it's an honor i'm getting paid for so yeah we definitely had fun and paul was the only guy who could make the undertaker laugh and break character i don't know if we're allowed to talk about the c word cucumber here i don't know oh, yeah we are bruce has talked about it go ahead yeah i can say i was witness to it and uh it's it's true darn true yeah i couldn't figure out what Paul was doing because he wasn't talking on the way to the ring. And the reason he wasn't talking is he had a slice of cucumber on his tongue. And as soon as the Undertaker hit the ring and Paul opened up his mouth and he sticks out his tongue, the Undertaker starts like, it was like, I hadn't seen retching like that since Bobby Eaton. Uh, Bobby had a notoriously weak stomach and I thought the Undertaker might lose it right there. And I never knew of the, uh, it was his kryptonite. Yeah, it was definitely his. <laughs> Gene Hackman opened up a lockbox and it had, uh, you know, uh, five, six uh, uh, large cucumbers in there. That would be the Undertaker's kryptonite. Do you remember hearing uh, the story of maybe someone, maybe Owen, I don't know, allegedly, <laughs> supposedly, putting sliced cucumbers in the Undertaker's boots? Ooh. I have not. That sounds like a, that sounds like an Owen type of thing. Yeah. That, uh, uh, that doesn't sound like a good idea though. No, it does not sound like a good idea. And that would just be an indication of how beloved Owen was that he could get away with that and, and not anger people. And I mean, you'd have to ask undertaker whether he's angry or not, but if anyone could pull it off, it would be Owen. Right. Well, let's talk about it. Um, he gets inducted. You get inducted on, uh, March 5th, but before he gets the chance to see you go in after he wrote those lovely words about your yep. nomination, he suffers a heart attack and passes away. It's a tough deal, man. Um, following his death, Paul bear is going to of course be brought back into that WWE storyline you touched on between him and punk. And they even have, you know, CM Punk sort of playing catch with the urn and mm -hmm. you see Paul Heyman, if you're watching on, uh, on YouTube, him bringing the urn out and they're making it a part of the storyline. And then eventually as he attacks the undertaker, after he's been dressed or disguised as one of these druids, he covers himself in the ashes. And the idea that punk poured quote unquote, <laughs> Paul bear all over himself, this is old school heat. And I'm sure this could go one of two ways. I'm sure there's a certain section of our audience who would say, well, that's disgusting. I can't believe they would do that. Then there's the old school wrestling folks who say, boy, Paul would have loved that. Where do you land on that? The fact that I have to deliberate about it is not a good sign. I think he would have liked it. I think he would have that. I mean, that is strikes me as being going a little too far. Uh, can I just inject, there's two things I want to inject here, a life's lesson and then a bombshell announcement okay. I'm making for the first time here. Okay. Um, 
and I can't go into specifics on the bombshell announcement, uh, but I was pretty tight with Punk at that point. And Punk was having a hard time getting excited for that match with The Undertaker because it was not the main event. Right. And I told him, I said, Phil, you decide what the main event is. The fans decide. You know, I think that Edge and I had uh, a right to say that we had the match of the night in 2006. And by no means, way, shape, or form were we advertised as the main event. You go out there and you try to steal the show. And in wrestling and in life, I think we, if I'm getting into DDP area, cut me off immediately, if not sooner. But I think in life, we do get to decide what our own great moments are. And so I think, you know, if Phil had been able to do that, I think he would have been happier and would still be on national TV. If, if he, yeah, that was the way I looked at things like that, I was proud to be Mr. In Your House, you know, like I'm okay with being the number one name in secondary pay-per-views. And uh, if I'm okay with that, then I think Punk should have been okay with having what could have been the match of the night. And uh, several people thought it was at that mania against The Undertaker. Um, and he wasn't, and that's, uh, that's a shame. So I think there's a cautionary tale there. The bombshell announced me. You ready for this? I'm ready. Received a text message from someone I'd had no contact with in a while, years and years, asking if I would induct them into the WWE Hall of Fame. Oh. Oh, so, uh, as this plays out, we will see. There's always a chance uh, that request will be denied, but I know this person responded back to WWE that I was in. And as of this moment, I'm counting on being there at the Hall of Fame to induct this person. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but uh, we will all find out together. Or if it's Ixnade, I'll let you know at that juncture in time. I'll let you know after the Hall of Fame who it was that asked me, but it was a day maker for sure. Um, someone who had uh, many different options and asked me. So I was really flattered, readily accepted. Um, and we will see how that comes, uh, how that comes to pass. If it comes to pass. Well, I've got a few guesses. Can't wait to hear the news. Um, ultimately you land on Paul would like the ash angle or Paul wouldn't have. <laughs> that may, might be one bridge too far for me. I'm sorry. Okay. A <laughs> little too far for you. A little, a little too far for me, but I'm, so I'm sorry. But I like the playing catch. Uh, Paul Heyman, obviously, it was a, a huge guy to build up that match. In my opinion, I'm going to go with a little too far for my own taste. Final answer. Guys, by now you've heard about Blue Chew on our program for a long time. Mick and I are big believers in Blue Chew, and we want you to try it. Sincerely, this isn't just for guys who have a <clears throat> problem. This is for guys who are trying to leave a lasting impression for guys who want to enhance their experience. Think about it as PEDs for your PENIS. Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers the same active ingredient as Viagra and Cialis, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime y'all day or night. So plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. And the process is simple guys is three steps. Number one, you sign up at bluechew.com. Number two, you'll consult with one of their licensed medical providers. And once you're approved, number three, you'll receive your prescription in just a few days. Blue Chew's tablets are made here in the USA. They're prepared to ship directly to your door. And by the way, it's in a discreet package. So don't worry about the mailman knowing your business. Okay. The best part, it's all done online. That means you get to skip the awkward conversations. You don't even have to go to the doctor's office. There's no waiting in line at the pharmacy. It doesn't get any easier than this. And I've never recommended Blue Chew to someone and they came back and said, oh, it didn't work. Everybody's like, hey man, uh, thanks for the pro tip. So if you could benefit from extra confidence when it's time to perform, chew it and do it, y'all. Let's have some better sex, shall we? And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free and use our promo code Foley at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is Foley to receive your first month free. 
Visit BlueChew.com for more details and important safety information. We thank BlueChew for sponsoring the podcast. Uh, we know that just one year after the whole Ash angle, the, the year where you got to go into the Hall of Fame, the next year, Paul took his rightful place in the WWE Hall of Fame. And he was, of course, inducted by his sons, as you see there, if you're watching along with us here on YouTube. Let's do some questions here. Let's try to end on a lighter note here. Sorry uh, about that. Yeah. A wrestling historian says, do you think the mankind Paul bear relationship could have lasted longer or did it end at the right time? I think it ended just when it should have, because my character was going through transitions and would not have lent itself as well to having uncle Paul there with me, but he was invaluable. And I think it lasted exactly as long as it should have. Here's one. Um, do you think Percy would have loved to help out Mick Foley claws at Christmas time during your special visits? I don't know. I don't, I don't see Percy as like the jolly elf type. I I'm sure he would have joined me, uh, here and there, but I wasn't really, you know, I did a lot of stuff around Christmas, but it was not until 2012 when I, you know, I'd worn the red suit, you know, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm not saying that just to brag about visiting our service members, although I did visit our service members and I was proud to wear the red suit. But I was just a guy in a suit and a, you know, wig and a beard. I didn't like dedicate myself until 2012. Um, it's hard to say. I know. I, I mean, I never had another WWE superstar accompany me. Um, uh, you know, there's the set, there's the, the story, the young rock episode, um, based in fact, but, uh, I wasn't, and I guess I was kind of Santa there, but I was Santa with a mask, clearly, uh, mankind dressed up as Santa. So I would say, I don't actually see that happening, but that's an interesting question. Here's one from Andrew Moss. He says, Paul is definitely on the Mount Rushmore of managers. What modern day wrestler do you feel Paul would be a, a, a perfect manager for? Oh man. Uh, um, carrying cross, uh, oh, that wow. Charlotte, but, uh, I'm thinking still going with the kind of mystical feeling, uh, could have been an asset to a lot of people. I'm trying to think of that perfect fit. We haven't really seen the likes of anybody like The Undertaker. No. Um, but uh, but we, we saw over, you know, during this episode alone, even if you were not a student of Paul Bearer's career, that he went through many incarnations and he was really good in all of them. I think the classic Paul Bearer was probably the one we all love the most, but yeah, he would probably be lending a hand, if not behind the scenes, then on the air to someone. And I'll give some thought, but the fact that Carrion Cross was my first uh, uh, pick means it was probably the right pick. Yeah, I would have never even thought of that since he has Scarlet, but yeah, that could work. I totally see that. Yeah. Uh, here's one from Johnny. In Mick's opinion, what was the funniest rib Paul ever did to Mick or another wrestler? Is it the cucumber or do you have? I think the, the cucumber because I had no idea about uh, the Undertaker's one weakness. So that was probably, uh, yeah, that was, that was probably my favorite moment in ring with Uncle Paul. And he, that the, there's nothing funny about the hair standing on him, but that was my favorite moment. And we got to do that every night for months. Uh, what a great time in my career and it, and, and Percy's Joey, the Tori Amos guy says, are you and Kane technically cousins? If Paul is your uncle, that's an excellent point. I guess we are well put my friend. <laughs> you got a, you got a mayor for a cousin. How about that? I do. And that would make me and the undertaker cousins as well, brother. You know what I'm, I'm saying, that. daddy? I got you, daddy. <laughs> uh, Scott golden here wants to know. What is the biggest life lesson Paul taught you? I think uh, that lesson uh, following, you know, my outburst uh, post uh, post telling a cell when I didn't think the fans uh, were with me um, to show some patience and, uh, you know, and really uh, impart upon me that a, uh, a new day was coming when the things I had to say would be valued. 
Well, well said. I, uh, I want to close with this one before we tease what we're talking about next week. This is from Will on Twitter. Hey, Mick, what's your all time favorite Paul Bear moment? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, I've discussed my all time favorite well, cucumber. Um, well, the all time favorite, uh, I'm going to go with the one I've talked about. Just the fact that it wasn't a moment, but a series of moments. It was just having that special time to realize how fortunate we were every night to be in the ring with the undertaker compare the hairs on our uh, arms, uh, standing on end. Like, uh, you know, we were marking out in the best sense of the word in that we were marveling at the spot we were in, realized how fortunate we were to be in it. And, uh, I like to think I appreciated it while it was happening, but I appreciate it even more so now. Well said. I hope we did a, a nice job paying tribute to Mr. Moody, uh, an Alabama wrestling legend, WWE Hall of Famer, and such an iconic manager. Uh, I think we could probably just sit and talk story, tell stories about this guy and, and, and bring other people on to do the same. Forever and ever, amen. But next week, we're going to be talking about another man, very important to your career, the man they call Sting. From your early WCW time together, what you thought of Sting, why Sting was never in the WWE until the more recent years, working with him in TNA and everything in between. Of course, you get all these pods early and ad-free over at adfreeshows.com. We're talking more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts. Starting with just nine bucks. Oh you man! Enjoy the first week with us completely free. Sign up for a free trial. Hey, Get a look, at, uh, look! Can I tell you something? Just last Please night, do. I joined Hallmark Movies Now. Uh, so for like the eight dollars a month, I get to watch all the Hallmark movies I want instead of paying three ninety nine a clip. And I think uh, when you make that investment in your own enjoyment, it, it's something you'll be uh, happy about. I, uh, I can't recommend it enough. Adfreeshows.com. Get a free trial today at adfreeshows.com. There you'll see incredible new bonus content, including a watch along of the classic flare steamboat match that started it all the shy town rumble. Jim Ross will watch that one alongside Ooh. you. Kurt angle will watch his match with Cody Rhodes. When Cody first walked away from the WWE, it's the only time they hooked up and it happened outside of a WWE ring. And Kurt watches it along with us. And how about this? We've got a brand new series. We've enjoyed Mike Kyoto's stories on Monday mailbag every other Monday. Well, starting this week, we had Nick Patrick on. So you got Ooh. all the stories from the other side. It's all over at adfreeshows.com. By the way, we have a lot of fun here making fun of the silly merch that we have. Go check it out for yourself. Uh, we've got some hilarious new shirts, including the brand new Cactus Jack Steakhouse and Saloon Tea. We got it. All right, we got it. We got it. We got a I'm a three day man shirt and Phantom Balls is back in stock. It's all available now at FoleyIsPodShirts.com. That's FoleyIsPodShirts.com. The shirt that started it all, though, the Mr. In Your House Tea. And you know what else started it all? Cameo. Now, this is definitely not an ad. We're no. just doing more of a public service announcement because I realize. Some of us maybe didn't give the best possible gift we could for Valentine's yeah. Day. Well, hey, you know what makes a good pick me up every day of the week? Cameo. Cameo.com forward slash Mick Foley. And we're on a quest to pass a supposed athlete. Come on, man. You're the number one most reviewed athlete. What are we doing here? Well, definitely the most reviewed. Uh, last year, Frank the Tank was the most requested. I got you. Um, I believe he's only got uh, about 1,300 reviews and, uh, if you saw the number 44,701 is almost triple of what any other athlete or wrestler has. And I think that's because they can see that I really, I really enjoy them. And, uh, I, I try my best to make everyone as good as it can be. And people recognize that. So I do love doing it. Um, it is a good, nice little, um, idea for gifts or for yourself. I've, I've booked a couple of, uh, hallmark actresses along with janice from friends uh for myself it's a good way to reward yourself and uh hey can i just throw people out there the uh, louisiana comic con which will be the 11th and 12th in lafayette uh and then the 24th through the 26th i'm in the richmond comic con 
and WrestleCon. And those are my, you can go to realmcfoley.com to check out upcoming dates. And uh, before I go, I want to thank everyone who's made the decision to listen to us. Um, I want to, I, pre- I appreciate that. I know there's a lot of other games in town and I appreciate you choosing ours. Thanks so much for tuning in for Folius pod. We greatly appreciate it. The best way to follow the show is on social at Foley is pod on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. But man, if you haven't seen the show, you don't know what you're missing. Go check it out. Foley on youtube.com. That's Foley on youtube.com. It's a totally different look and everything else we do on our podcast network here. We think you'll dig it. It's Foley on youtube.com next week, man. Sting. That should be a good show. No, I think so. One of the biggest, uh, uh, people in my entire career and, uh, be happy to talk about our times together. We'll be talking about the man called sting next week, right here on Foley is pod. Yeah. Hey guys, Tony Schiavone need to call a timeout real quick. Wanted to tell your listeners what I've been telling what happened when listeners for a while now about all the cool things happening over on adfreeshows.com. An all new edition of the insiders is here as Conrad sits down with former WWE exec, John Filippelli, who discusses his transition from the world of sports to pro wrestling and his ultimate transition out of the company. Every take was getting worse than the one before. I said, you gotta stop. You gotta stop this. You gotta calm down. Stop. Calm down. Stop yelling at people. Take it easy. Tell them exactly what you want and we'll get through it. Which is, I have done a hundred times since and I would do a hundred times more. Yes. But that was Vince McMahon and you don't do that to Vince McMahon, particularly in front or around other people. people. Yeah. Was, that was my mistake. I mean, if you want to call it a mistake, although I would do it, I've done it since and I would do it again. Referee Nick Patrick is answering your questions every other Monday on our new mailbag secret. When Holland Nash was there, you know, he was a great worker, so they could get beat at psychology. But they were cool. And a lot of people liked it, you know? Yeah, we're still at merch, you know? And, and, and Hogan had heat. He, turned, he had actually more heat than them. You know, they had heat, but a lot of people liked it because they were cool. I was like the only real character that they was calling in the other time that everybody hated. You know, like, yeah, everybody wanted to see me get <laughs> so it worked. You know, they had, you know, so I they had, I uh, yeah, and, and so it worked, you know. Tony and Conrad have taken their shenanigans in front of a live studio audience as they sat down live with Ad Free Shows members. Hey, um, did you ever uh, pet Jake Snake? No, never did. I had a chance to in Chicago, but it was it was way too big and out of my league. Mm. What's the right size snake for you? Uh, one that just coils up and leaves me alone. Yeah. Have you ever orange to Cassidy before? Orange to Cassidy? Yeah. Or would that be with the with one of those juicers, the juice machine, or you just squeeze it until all the juice comes out of it. <laughs> yeah, it runs down your leg or his leg. You gotta, you gotta, be, gotta be specific here with your dumbass question, dear Cassio. That's just a small taste of what we got waiting for you with four levels to choose from. See for yourself. My ad free shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adfreeshows.com. <laughs> <laughs>